Good afternoon. Today we have an expert club about uh, Belarusian law enforcement bodies and what we can expect from them. I would like to remind you that we, as always, are recording our discussion. The recording will be available at the Press Club YouTube channel. Those of you who would not want to miss our new videos, feel free to subscribe to us according to the Chatham House rules. The guests of the Analytical Club um, are not allowed to disseminate information about this meeting outside the club, but this rule is subject to special rules. If you don't want to get quoted, please warn us before you uh, start speaking. All other guests will know that uh, they are not allowed to call you on that. Also, we have uh, interpretation ready. If you feel more comfortable listening to us in English, feel free to switch to the English channel interpretation. Today's speakers, um, Alexander Azarov, representing by the BIPOL initiative. Good afternoon. Svetlana Hilko was uh, people's anti-crisis management. I, I don't think she has joined us yet. Sanderson is a military expert, who will join us later. Igor Libidok is a military expert. Hello. Arseniy Sivitsky, the co-founder of the uh, think tank. On strategic studies. Vadim Mazeka is the moderator today. The floor is yours, Vadim. Hello again. Hopefully, Svetlana Hilko will join us soon. I'll be able to tell her. Good morning. Indeed, today we are discussing a very relevant topic. And I think it's one of the most complicated ones because for many reasons, many people don't want to touch this subject. I think all these things only highlight the importance that this subject possesses because over all those months of political crisis in Belarus, we have undoubtedly seen a lot of unexpected, both positive and negative things done by and actions done by our law enforcement bodies. Among them, unprecedented violence we encountered. We also discussed how unprecedented the outflux of the key is happening now. Those who are not leaving the system, they are shown loyalty to the system. We'll see that this situation in many ways always affect our life and the activities in Belarus in the near future. Therefore, we decided to talk about this today. Once again, I would like to thank the speakers that decided to join us today. I would also like to thank the wonderful guests we have. The first question that we'll be raising today is the mood that uh, we witness in the Lloyd Mosman borders. We must say that the people working in the law enforcement bodies are all different. I mean, they all have different perception of the reality. But let's try to discuss this and let's think what we can expect from the Silvery Key in case the violence escalates further. How they will act. I would like to start with Alexander, who represents the Bipol initiative. In the past, Alexander is the attorney colonel, also worked with the uh, internal Syria Ministry Academy and worked in the anti-crime service. Alexander, 
you, what do you think about the status quo? As a representative of the bipolar initiative, I directly communicate with people who still work in the law enforcement bodies or those who recently left the service or were sacked. We are monitoring the moods and we know what is happening at the time, at the moment. In terms of the new wave of protest and the new escalation, I guess this is what you asked, um, uh, what the response from the Silviki will be. Silviki are divided into number of castes. Those who serve in the right police and the major attack fighting against crime, special units, and those who serve in a central office of the interior ministry or the regional offices. They all have different understanding and they think differently because the low level units are really lacking staff. So they're trying to hire more and more people, uh, recent army recruits who are fresh. The, the authorities are trying to brainwash them uh, subscribe them to various program and telegram channels, show them movies, propaganda movies. So I believe they expected to do whatever authorities want them to do. Also, there are those who participated in uh, uh, crimes against the protesters who tortured people. They have nowhere to go. They'll be performing any orders, following any orders they're told, because they think uh, that uh, if and when Lukashenko leaves, they and their family members will be hanged on, on the trees. But if we look at the higher tiers of the law enforcement activities uh, and borders, people are different there. Of course, the um, people will be probably holding to their position. I know that there are lots of people who left the ranks of, of, uh, of the Slovaki, but there are also people who were offered higher posts and they uh, forgot about their conscience in many ways and they continue to serve the authorities. Many of them are highly educated. They have several higher educations, two, and I even had three when I served there. They discussed what we see outside in groups. And uh, I don't think that all of them follow the orders of using combat weapons. If there's a critical mass of people, if people take to the streets in the numbers similar to those in August or even more, the Silviki will probably lay down their weapons. Now they're working in um, unbearable conditions. You probably have heard that uh, they're no longer allowed to go abroad. Before they want to do that, they need to apply for a certain pass to be able to cross the border. They can go have uh, on holidays in limited number of countries. Also, they regularly are checked on uh, using the lie detector. The authorities know that we are communicating with them. They are trying to and to find out who these people are who communicate with us and they're afraid. 
They're afraid be, to talk with each other about political issues on for this particular reason. They're afraid of getting caught and uh, persecuted. That's all from me. Let's hear other people speak. Thank you, Alexander. Tigor or Arseniy, the floor is yours. Who goes first? Who has anything to add? We have just discussed the practical side of things. It's clear that analytics are seeing things differently. I'm not uh, either a politician or analytic or analyst. Igor, what do you think of all this? What do you think of the moods in uh, the interior ministry? What are your impressions? Are you more, would you think people are more optimistic or pessimistic? In terms of interior ministry, I would add the territorial borders as the uh, August last year showed policemen outside and of Minsk and further away was not particularly trying very hard to persecute protesters. It was usually done by the interior military or the right police. The regional police know that there are 10 people of them, everybody knows them in the face. Every day they meet the protesters unlike the right police. This, of course, affects them, affects their um, mindset and activities. It's more clear what they are doing, what their colleagues are doing in Minsk, but a further away from Minsk, it's all different. Because we see some Silaviki, uh, doing their best some of them trying very hard to get new position to do, get new post but in army uh, the difference is even bigger as what we saw happening last year there's a special operations unit which are very different from the regular military units the special operations unit were formed based on the experience of what happened in Ukraine in 2014. They are highly mobile units. They are equipped where an armed, uh, especially in a special way. But the regular army is a totally different thing. You remember our brigade number 120 uh, used against people, but the people uh, did not mind. I mean, so if they are not attacked by the protesters, I don't think they will react much. But this is the, in case we have a martial law introduced, this is where they will be used. In terms of KGB, there are senior officers and, uh, of course, uh, regular soldiers and junior officers. Well, regular um, soldiers don't really care much. If I want, if I need to paint the grass, I'll do that. If I have to, if I'm ordered to, go and persecute and uh, the protesters, uh, I'll do that, but higher rank officers, of course, think deep, think longer about that, because they uh, have to think twice because of the uh, higher salaries and uh, the apartments they're given. Battalion commanders, 
are the key figures here uh, when it comes to protecting the authorities. Their main problem is that they need to get a pension and uh, also includes the career growth. They have a chance of getting a higher position, higher post, easier. And on the other hand, some of them have 10 years of service, have a flat and uh, not particularly high salaries. So this is the group of people who are mobile in terms of decision taking. Some of them will be doing their best to jump higher. Usually they are not highly professional. And there are those officers uh, who think different. Well, much longer before uh, the recent elections, the last elections, uh, there were began the replacement of the more professional people, professional staff with the more loyal ones. And this is, of course, in many ways, a pet peeve for true officers, and they're not comfortable with that. This is directly connected to the question about the future of the officers. In terms of illustration, two major things need to be considered. Non-committance of uh, crime and professionalism. Usually, if a person who supports Lukashenko is highly competent, there's a reason to uh, keep this person after illustration. What does it help us with. It makes it comfortable for a regular officer who has dedicated his or her life to defend the motherland. We are now facing the moral dilemma. What to do next? And the major problem here for many people, it's clear with Lukashenko. We need to understand that the army did not really was not really affected by the protest. Just the, the Brigade 120 and several others. But that's basically it. They don't understand what happens if Lukashenko leaves. There's no clear proposition about the future. And the words like human rights, reforms, cargo cult. Uh, mili militia turned in, instead into police and so on. Everybody understands that uh, these are empty words with no end goal inside. Many people see the absence of end goal and they're not reacting. They don't know what happens next. It's clear that some leaders like Tikhanovskaya and, and others have expressed their views on that, but there's no unified approach, unified proposal. In other words, what, what is the future for Silviki, for Lawrence Mosman? On the one hand, some people say that uh, the law enforcement officers need to be sent to, into exile. Others believe they need to be basically hang, hanged on the post. And this is clear for every person. They need to select the better option. The better option for them is the status quo. Of course, this is an abstract statement about what Siliki wants. I just want to understand what the clear reform or proposition needs to sound like and look like. 
if we call the human rights an abstract thing, we don't, we're not urgent, so we key to observe human rights. Should we basically tell them about the concrete things like apartments? But what do you think it should look like? For any Silavik, there are two sides. The apartment is the social part. It's not always the deciding one, but they need to be explained how the, our security will be cons constructed. They need to understand how they will be trained and what future they will have. Then, what the role for special units, army, KGB, and interior ministry will be in the protection? The two lines are important. The clear security and safety concept. And the second one is the social side. They are interconnected. And for many, particularly young officers, the understanding that the motherland needs you and uh, understanding of what they will need to do for the motherland is very important. In many ways, more important than the social side. So the social side also includes two aspects, the present and their future. We see two elements here. Few of them have uh, possibility to, to get additional education, particularly those who um, spend their time in the active drills during their service time. What means they feel they're weak in the face of the propagandist tricks when the authorities tell them that nobody wants you uh, outside the military force, even though that may not be true. So the senior officers needs to understand how they will be employed after they uh, leave the service. The United States has a, a very clear cut approach here. First they serve, they leave their service, and then they're very much in demand as the manager, or starting from university to the industrial enterprise or consultant with the military. We've never raised this issue at the serious level. Even though things do change in the country, we need to understand what the future holds for them. We need to make an officer the first best citizen who understands what the military bloc wants, who regular people want and how the uh, demands intersect. Uh, um, propagandists uh, um, are saying that uh, we confront a new situation. You understand that both officers and uh, GIs they come up to the secondary school. We understand our secondary school levels are very low. Also, they are forced to encourage to obey the authorities. You know, to uh, have a, the better soldiers and uh, GIs, we need to reform our educational system. We need to teach them how to think on their own how to act on their own in terms of military combat soldier needs to be a military unit independent one also capable of acting in small groups those who have reached the age of 18 in some ways are a lost cause we need 10 more years a decade to get another generation of the military. So it's neither the NATO nor Russia for us. 
in the future. We need to bet on our own self. There are huge number of ways how to protect ourselves, even though we are sometimes considered a small state. If we plan ahead for this, if we inform and raise awareness about this with the military at every level, it will be a big plus. It is very seldom done at the moment. People know what they need to do at their own level and maybe at the next level, but nobody really understands what CSTO is and what the uh, legal regulations are, when we have to support them, when they have to support us. People don't know this. Usually it boils down to watching the Panorama TV program or any other propagandist stuff. It's a multifaceted approach that needs to be applied here from the uh, different approaches. But it is possible. Ideally, it's the national security concept that needs to be put on the table. If it is, it will be criticized, which is normal. But there will be something that is subject to debate. It's not about has been with the NATO, with the CSTO, but a clear-cut understanding of the future may hold for us. Thank you very much, Igor. I think Igor has frozen. Igor is back. I think I've, I've, I've said it all, said everything what I wanted. I like your ideas or the a decade that is needed for reform. But um, if we tell it to the current recruits, I don't think they will be highly encouraged by that. Still. I, I know it may sound silly, but still. Thank you, Igor. Arseniy, floor is yours. What do you think about the mood and the military block, or the Mauson block? What do you think should be the steps to have these moods change? Or do you think everything is great? In terms of mood, it's important to highlight the following aspects. Overall, the military bloc and the CLVK, particularly the uh, top ranks, they feel they are the winners using the force, the power, they managed to stabilize the political situation. They uh, have seen that the unproportional use of force is effective. Consequently, if the forces are used in the maximum, on the maximum scale, an absolute effect could be achieved. Hence, I believe that they are ready to do everything they are demanded to. Even their activities and actions that they were performed by them in August and September last year, like unproportional use of force and use of uh, lethals and non-lethals, various military equipment against uh, the peaceful citizens, as well as the, uh, the use of the new type of concentration camps. It all testifies to the fact that there are no limits to repressive tactics there that they could use. And, uh, currently, this experience for the CLV key themselves shows that such activities uh, 
may not have the, re the repercussions. I will agree with the previous speakers on this and Yegor and Alexander in the sense that overall, Siliki as a cast have uh, blood on their hands. Indeed, there's, there's no way they can hide. There's no going back for them. From this point of view, they'll be ready to follow almost any order. But it will happen until the state performs the responsibilities in line with the social contract. In other words, as long as the Slaviki get the remuneration plus the bonuses they are promised for what they do, and their repressive actions. Until then, the social bloc will be monolithic. Can you hear me? One, two, three. Those who has been disloyal have been fired or downgraded or put in a honorary position. But those who feel some, the morals cannot sustain that, they uh, left by their own volition. So I don't think we'll, we should be having illusions about it. As the experience of Venezuela showed where the regime also bet on the, the use of force and violence against their own citizens, Overall, the Siloviki is the society layer that the state will be obliging in terms of contractual obligations until the last breath. So the social contracts will be broken with other society groups. And we see that the it's already happening with uh, uh, private enterprises with the pensioners with the youth but so far still the key have been the only foundation of the authorities and the state is uh, intending to keep it this way This is what I wanted to add. Thank you, Arseny. Uh, well, uh, I don't see any optimistic, any reason for optimism. I think an important psychological side of the problem is that the Law Enforcement Corporation believes that the protests that have been happening, that happened from August until December, were in many ways inspired by an insignificant part of the Belarusian society, so-called the collective minority. And until Selviki see uh, as long as uh, they see uh, this group of people as the minority they will perform any orders but as soon as the psychological perception changes the situation may change and the only trigger that can prompt 
so they keep to rethinking that what is what is happening in society is the um, economic collapse a large-scale one when uh, not only social demographic groups that i mentioned uh, smes the youth people the young people and pensioners will take the streets to the streets but also the so-called proletariat will the working class as well and the only scenario that uh, can provoke uh, this development of events is the large-scale economic crunch i think that today on the whole the situation is uh, still manageable by the authorities but if the sanction pressure increases i mean from outside the state both from the side of the west and russia which will speculate on this pressure and uh, pass on limitations i think the next year may become may pose a significant threat to lukashenko and become a very significant challenge to lukashenko according to his latest comments he sees the main threat for him particularly in the economic side and not uh, from uh, or not coming from his political opponents whom he had managed to put in a so-called protest underground consequently i believe that until the social and economic situation is stable we shouldn't expect that the protests will renew in any form and shape. Thank you, Arseniy. Thanks everyone who sent questions to the chat. I'd like to remind you that we'll be able to answer the questions later. And I guess Svetlana hasn't joined us yet. Maybe it's uh, due to the time difference. I would be interested in term, uh, considering that what Igor said, uh, the necessary reforms will be interesting to know Svetlana's opinion on this. Well, let's go get back to questions. After what Arseny said, uh, the picture is, looks quite sad, but let's think about the major conclusions we can draw after August 2020 events. I think uh, we should ask Alexander about that because he used to be part of the Silviki, those Silviki. What do you think is happening among your friends, among your colleagues in the military? Have you seen anything new? Do you think there are major conclusions that you may draw? How exactly it affected you as well? For Siloviki, most important thing is to disperse uh, the fears of getting fired because they don't understand that they can imagine what uh, they will do in the regular life. When I, after serving 20 years, left the military service, I uh, felt reborn. Usually, when you want to change your professional sphere, you prepare a certain platform. You're looking for a new job, switch jobs, and then you work. And the recent events 
led to people leaving the service or inability to perceive the violence from their personal views. I uh, left the Interior Ministry Academy. When I was doing that, I saw the 15 uh, people wanted to get fired, wanted to leave the service. Among them, uh, there were high rank officials. I thought about that a little bit longer and then I uh, fired for uh, uh, also, uh, we uh, see there's a certain wave of hatred towards the military, and many of the military think that if they're trying to find a job outside the military, they will not be hired. Many people are afraid of saying that they had served in the interior ministry and uh, uh, in the law enforcement in general, with the fear of um, uh, of uh, getting snubbed. There is also a problem for them. They need to pay off their loans. Usually they take loans, uh, many of them do, uh, low interest rate loans. Usually people spend all the money uh, ahead of the time and they need to pay them off, pay them back to the state. Also among them, there are the loans uh, for uh, apartments. We have appealed to the military through our channel. Uh, to we have appealed to regular businessmen to hire the former CLVK and about five uh, employers uh, contacted us saying that they will hire them. Of course, it, it's not about the people who uh, conducted crimes and the particularly grievous ones, even though it's now very difficult to find among, among the military people who have not committed any crime. Uh, particularly connected to the recent events. That's actually one of the goals of the authorities who have turned to Svetlana Tikhanovskaya headquarters to appeal to the Siloviki. Uh, uh, appeal to their conscience to try to dispel their fears. By soul, by help, I involved in the retraining services and providing them for the former Siloviki. We checked the so key for uh, the um, role, particular role uh, in any crimes. If they haven't committed any crimes, I don't think it will be a problem for them to find a regular job. It's actually important to, uh, and almost impossible to help them pay off uh, their debts. So if people are leaving the service, they're trying to um, work until the end of their contract agreement or their work agreement. As soon as the contract expires, they, many of them leave the service. So there's a... a it has been reported that a group of customs borders officials who started from uh, 2016 to 2020 uh, left the service as soon as their first contract expired. It's important for politicians to dispel their fears, to tell them they will not be hung on trees. Uh, tell them that you will be responsible for the crimes you committed. Uh, there will be no uh, executions by a military squad. So the, the politicians need to do that, need to allay people's concerns, to reassure them. 
с силовиками, да говорили, ну да, ну там что-то эти политики себе предпринимают. But I've read some people comment on this, saying that they, they don't believe the politicians and the politicians' words. What do you think is necessary for the military to believe in that? In other words, what do Belarus and Siloviki believe? Well, they believe in the force and the in the, in the crude force, you know? So how do we convince them that uh, this uh, support is not a myth, but the truth? Currently, the servicemen are banned from reading opposition telegram channel or understand what is actually happening. They're living there in, in a world they're watching the BT news and TV propaganda. Just like Lukashenko once said, we are having an informational warfare. The politicians, the bloggers need to understand how to get this message across to them, servicemen. If uh, even then, even though the Slovakia may not possess this information their nearest and dearest may get access may have access to this in many cases of people divorcing their wives divorcing uh, their husbands who have committed crimes against protesters the recent case was a road policeman uh, whose wife divorced him after he was seen uh, committing crimes against protesters. Uh, his friends and family basically excommunicated him. So this uh, approach works. This information needs to be spread through all the channels, YouTube channels, Telegram channels, all mass media channels available. All the politicians must particularly those who have some weight, need to dispel the fears. We still need to draft a list of fears and dispel one after another. We are also ready to give a hand to politicians in this respect. Alexander, after August 2020, did you learn anything new about you uh, from my colleagues about the military oh, wait i mean i uh, i uh, don't think i uh, have learned anything new after serving there for 20 years i know the service inside out i uh, the only thing i the only place i didn't serve where i didn't serve is the army but the interior term ministry is like an open book for me. I, uh, I'm learning about new crimes, about uh, people, their transformation. In August, for example, there were more people against the regime than there are now. Those who were, some of them left the service, were sacked or try to express their opinions, trying to keep their position. In August, people did get together in the smoking rooms and discuss what was happening. Some people agreed, some disagreed with what was happening. And I remember out of 10 people, nine people were against what was done and one supported the third is. Now, even in the sauna, they don't raise this topic. And it's difficult for them to understand who is for, who is against. Outside, they're all for the authorities. Right, let's give floor to Yegor. You're the same question. Have you learned anything new about your... 
uh, army buddies, buddies, work buddies, colleagues. You need to understand that since 1994 and 1995, Lukashenko was trying to adjust the military bloc to himself and to his ideas and plans. We remember Mr. Ganchar was barred away from the parliament and so on and so forth. For many years, Lukashenko have been rearing the military bloc in this way. Of course, the army was also taught uh, to maybe uh, fight with NATO if it happens. But ideologically, Lukashenko was uh, trying to rear a class, a military class that would protect his interests. Eventually, a particular layer of the military was formed who don't care, which doesn't care who they serve, particularly those uh, with uh, uh, junior officers. In a sense, many of them were trying to get back at the bullies that they faced at school. And they were bullied as children, as teenagers. Now they're kings, basically. They can beat any highbrow scientist in the street with a baton. In many ways, it's a, actually a huge threat for us if Russia decides to invade with the fast moving mobile units. But it's good that this has happened in the sense that if the regime changes, they, uh, these people will be doing the same, they're following the orders. If they are ordered to uh, arrest the former bosses, they will do that because they're doing their job, they're being paid for. It's hard to understand how many of them are proportionally, but there are quite a few of them in the military and as the law enforcement block. On a bigger scale. Again, it's a two way sword. It's a big threat, but on the other hand, this is the group of people that will follow orders, perform tasks. So I don't think we should fire uh, these military block representatives in block. Because in this respect, uh, the former military provocation proponents may just openly express the uh, will to overturn the new regime. If there is no military bloc. This is the solution and the problem in one thing. And the approach to Slaviki needs to be very careful. Of course, those who committed crimes needs to be put on trial, but others needs to have a selective treatment. In other words, they shouldn't be affected in a major way. They need to perf continue performing their functions, working for, let's say, new authorities. Again, another problem we're facing that Ukraine did face at the time. Uh, there was, uh, they didn't have any court reforms. And uh, many people, after they were fired by the station committee, they turned to the court and they were reinstated in their position. Again, should we actually 
wouldn't try the people who uh, prosecute or persecuted protesters. I mean, should you punish people for following orders? It is a gray area. It's undecided. They may say that I followed the order in line with the legislation. Many are saying that they uh, these people have committed crimes, but even though it's clear with the Nazis, they were put on trial under tribunal uh, and they were tried under external legislation. It's not particularly clear what to do in Belarus. It's a big problem that we will be facing. That, that was an interesting uh, thought that uh, uh, the former Siloviki may rebel, may rebel, uh, rise. Again, it's very difficult to understand what to do next, but we may face the relapse in this respect. Uh, to Arseni and ask Arseni about uh, his impressions about the Siloviki. Have you learned anything new um, about these people in the August events? What uh, lessons did you draw? Conclusions did you draw? Well, actually, I wasn't particularly surprised by the violence we witnessed on the side of uh, law enforcement block towards the protesters. In fact, from the very beginning of the electoral campaign, or the presidential campaign, the military block, particularly the special units, special forces, were prepared for the very like, tough scenario. It was actually obvious and very much clear from the uh, Lukashenko's visit to the special units headquarters. This uh, show of force and dispersal of the so-called military operations. Colleagues, please turn up your microphones to avoid interference. Personally, I was ready to what we saw to this scenario, bloody field scenario. I noted the serious lack of professionalism on the part of the special units compared to the previous crisis years. Remember how the 30,000 people protests were dispersed in 2010, in December, right after the presidential election. Comparing the consequences of the dispersals, we see that when the protests were dispersed in August and September, the use of force was totally unprofessional. I mean, the unproportional reaction to the threat. From this point of view, this is indeed a serious problem for the national security and for the political stability inside the country, because I uh, firmly believe that a large-scale protest that we witnessed on August 10th, next day after the election, we're connected not with the election rigging, but with the bloody 
dispersal of the protest on the evening of the 9th of August, right after the polling stations closed. So this unprofessional approach of the Siloviki played a bad joke on Alexander Lukashenko. And in many ways, the bloody dispersals, they made a blow on the Alexander Lukashenko's legitimacy in the eyes of the regular people, and later undermined his legitimacy at the international arena. So the, the less Slaviki, the Slaviki are professional, the more problems they, the more they are the problem for the authorities, the authorities uh, become dependent on the military and uh, law enforcement cooperation, which in turn uh, will, will be trying to manipulate the authorities because they understand that there's no way back. And let's not forget about the external pressure, the sanctions and everything. In terms of the legislation, Belarus so far hasn't changed its constitution, um, has not made any approximation with the Russian constitution. And we have the international law that is uh, more important here and takes precedence. If we analyze what happened uh, in August 2010, 2020, we'll see that uh, even though the actions of the Soviet Union were in line with the local legislation, they were actually very much against international legislation. And the UNDP representatives even had several meetings with the interior ministry officials and the foreign ministry officials where they raised the issue of uh, following the international legal norms. I would uh, particularly focus on two major norms here. First and foremost is the proportionality of force to the emerging threat. We see here that, uh, that the force was actually indiscriminate and unproportional, very much unprofessional. Secondly, the, mar uh, the marking and the, since the state has the monopoly on violence, the military units and the law enforcement units need to have uh, particularly signs. And uh, marks. Uh, so they cannot act as um, some anonymous force, which is also uh, armed, because the border between the violence that is monopolized by the state and the violence which is unsanctioned is getting blurred here we also see that in majority of the cases particularly in august and september 2020 uh, the law enforcement enforcement officials that took part in the um, dispersal of the crowds were unmarked or wore unmarked uniforms. Also, talking about the future, of the Siloviki and the military bloc, should it be illustrated, should be amnested, should the amnesty be applied? I want to refer to the experience of the South African Republic, where after the, the apartheid regime was 
were down, there was a special commission that was launched, uh, which guaranteed amnesty or, or or free pardon to all former law enforcement officials who confessed to their crimes. The only problem there was with the uh, crime against humanity. There were several exceptions there. Several people were actually put on trial for this. But talking about the models and uh, experience of some other nations and states, this experience could be a, a tool that could come in handy. Thank you very much. Thank you. We're moving to a third question, because before we have a Q&A from Chad, let's discuss what happens next. Because Alexander outlined the situation uh, on the future of Soviki, we'll have to find a job. We understand that they need to have a possibility to get a job. Uh, to be able to leave his post and no longer use the basin against the peaceful protesters. But again, if I open my coffee shop, do I want to hire a person who hit me with a baton in the square? Well, that's a big question. So we're facing a problem here. And there are a number of big scale solutions here, they come to mind. On the one side, you know, there's a, there were several proposals. One of them was to basically hand them all, and the other was to simply let them go. But, uh, saying to Silviki that don't worry about that, you'll uh, keep your position, even though you hear us, is wrong. So this concept will also be actually accepted by the society. What do you think the future holds for the, for us and for them? In this respect, what's, uh, I think we should start with Alexander, who recently said in his interview to Belsad and raised this issue. So the question is, how will the system work? How many people will remain? How many people will, will be let go? And so, Alexander, please unmute yourself. In terms of re reforms of the interior forces, it still needs to be developed. But I believe that the units that uh, have blood on their hands uh, need to be uh, disbanded, like uh, Gubopik and uh, Sobor. They need to be replaced by similar units with a new staff. But the idea of the special commission that will have to check Uh, the current military bloc members. What's well, uh, no use disbanding them now, them now because the anarchy will follow. If you, just like Igor said, you kick them out now, they uh, can get in groups and uh, get back the power in their hands. But uh, you get put them to a lie detector test. We have a single book of crime registry with a number of people who have committed crimes. 
they need to be tried and investigated for their crimes. All the rest have to be retrained, have to take the lie detector test. But again, it's clear the top management must leave. To do that, we need to uh, make certain steps. As I said, we have uh, special people in each and every uh, unit of this kind, a service of this kind, who will be ready to get appointed. Later, they will be put in charge of the process, the people that we trust. There'll be a set up a special committee that will involve scientists, public figures, in order to develop certain measures. Unfortunately, Svetlana has not joined us still, so there's not much use to discuss the reform without her. However, how much synchronized do you think the BIPOL is now with the, the an analyst? Well, let's say Svetlana has come up with a certain draft reform. What do we do next? We cooperate with all the bodies and democratic organizations, including the uh, current um, management on the anti-crisis situation. As far as I know, many organizations are busy now thinking about reforms of the military, the law enforcement. Some of the similar reforms were published several years ago. I'll tell you more. I'm uh, very much currently trying to learn more about the experience of other states in this respect, and I'm planning to, to work more on uh, my own reform of the internal, internal ministry, but it's difficult to select one. As I said, a special commission needs to be set up that will involve the representatives of the political circles, scientists who have the relevant education, skills, and experience, and I'm very much uh, ready to come up with suggestions for the new reforms. They will come up with something optimal for the situation. Thank you, Alexander. Igor, what do you think about the reforms? If we want to avoid the harsh illustration, but what can we do to avoid the mistakes made by the Ukrainians? Um, analyzing the experience of the military reforms and purges in the last 20 years, we single out several mistakes. One of them is again uh, the cargo cult. Even though it may have scientific foundation, but if the national factor is not considered and the practical steps are not considered, leaving the, the reform a well thought out concept, it is a problem. The second, or rather the third point, is the current threat that the reforms are facing, particularly the law enforcement block. First, is the revenge and the desire of many people who suffered to take their revenge. This actually negatively affects the situation. Just like Arseniy said, the committee needs to be set up. But if, for example, a, a right policeman 
says that I did hit people and tortured people. Uh, how would regular people react to this? During the transformation period, Um, many people will follow or try to follow the psychological approach when the winners, winner takes it all and does everything they want, anything they want with the losers. Judging by the politicians who are affecting the public opinion, we see that many of them are actually talking about this revenge. more systemic approaches that we face due to Lukashenko is the misunderstanding of the state institutions and the law enforcement block. For them, in, after the army uh, police force discarded themselves, they need to be done away with. So unfortunately, people don't understand the nature of the state institutions, including the parliament and so on. Why? Well, there is a problem. That happened because of the 26 years. It's very much the same in Russia, whose information field seriously affects the mindset of Belarusians. We need to understand that three and four generations of people were living under one person authority. And this misunderstanding negatively affects the reforms. Many people just simply don't want to understand why some institutions are necessary. It's better to have the purges and to cut those guys, do away with them. But if we look at the situation on the spot, you know, we'll see that uh, just regular policemen are lacking, particularly in the provinces. And the third threat is that the people misunderstand or don't understand at all the importance of the state institutions. Each of them has its own, own purpose. Some of them uh, needs to be strengthened. After the transformation, the focus will be changed. These are three factors that form the threats, make up the threat to any reforms. Therefore, the most important reform to be conducted in the next two years is to keep things the same. The system needs to be purged of the people who uh, had a compromise with their conscience, with the law, who are amoral. This will give us the following situation. There will be no inertia and people will not reject the new authorities. Then people will see that uh, they may have the future. Particularly those who are immoral. Another point they will understand that uh, the, they need to self-improve. Also, at the political level, there will be no perturbation, there will be no major change. And the, the people will see that the system is trying to uh, change itself. Well, how uh, can we change something if people don't understand how to do that? Many people are. Uh, saying that let's do away with the presidential republic, let's have a parliamentary republic. 
in order to have these global political reforms, the stabilization phase is needed. People need to forget all this instability. They need to feel that uh, they're responsible. They need to be educated. They should not be told that you should have this or that or the other political transformation. There needs to be a massive campaign, much uh, bigger than the this Zoom conference that we're having now. As soon as people understand what the country needs, in the sense that we need to replace uh, Vice for Peter, for Peter, when they are psychologically stable, when they understand how the decisions are made, when they have a, at least a minimal knowledge, I'm not talking about the school knowledge, I'm talking about the real knowledge, at least 70% of the population. These three factors, when we have them, then we think about the political reforms. I don't think it will happen within the three years, but for two years, we need to stabilize the society, prevent big shifts to the left, to the right. The presidential republic is good in some ways. Uh, in many senses. I mean, uh, at least in order to conduct the purges. The reverse trend is also clear the power needs not to be re reserved. But so far, the population is not feeling stable. All the layers of society, even though that uh, feel that they are, don't play any part in that. This is one of the reasons to uh, have the Silviki block reformed. Right, the uh, is a proponent of the slow reforms. Arseny, what do you think about that? Should the reforms should, uh, should they be quick, fast-paced? Uh, we had the recent example about South African Republic. Should we adapt this example to the person reality? Considering the problems that countries faced. faced. I think reforms could be conducted on the basis of for peace, I'll explain. Indeed, the experience of South African Republic should be considered. Despite the legitimate emotional reactions from the, the side of the people who were repressed, were oppressed and persecuted. But we have an example in front of our eyes when a civil commission was not created and the military bloc went through a, a serious illustration. I think it was Poland when the former Silviki who were purged self-organized in, into uh, gangs. So I believe any 
sudden shifts of this kind could will lead to a similar results in Belarus. The purged Slaviki may regroup in gangs and become new gangsters. The experience of the coalition should be again applied and considered, but the only conclusion here is uh, hum the crimes against humanity that can be defined and as the direct and uh, systemic harm to health of the people and to uh, have human dignity without a necessary cause. The, there have been plenty of cases like this during the protest events. But is there any need? I mean, uh, I mean, there are cases when the force is applied proportionally based on the threat and the crime against humanity is a totally opposite thing. And this will be the mechanism mentioned by Yegor, the mechanism of purge of the Silviki bloc, of the people who added the, up uh, the for no reason at all, for no proper reason. Next is the retraining. or pre-attestation, requalification of the people who would like to stay in the ranks, those who will not pass this test, uh, but still want to remain in the ranks, also pose a problem because this requires uh, calls for a new educational structure. Finally, after these three steps, we may think about um, national security concept and reforms based on the best practices and cutting approaches as well as strategic interests. So the three points here, reformatting, reattestation, reconciliation, and I will re re repeat once again that the, the unprofessionalism of uh, the military and uh, law enforcers on uh, August 9th and 10th led to these, to what we have now. So the unprofessional Silviki is a threat to the international reputation of the country and to the internal situation. Thank you. Thank you, Arseny, indeed. Uh, this could be a true threat. I don't know if Svetlana uh, has joined us, but we still have some questions from the chat. Uh, one of them mentioned the Ukrainian reforms. So I call upon all our guests to use the raise your hand button. If you have a short commentary or question about a topic, please raise your hand. 
Let's now read the questions in the chat. The first question is the following. Is there statistics about the number of the Silviki who left the country after leaving the service? As I know there is a data, but I don't know if you can make it public. There's no clear statistics on that. So we don't know how many people actually left the country. I don't think anybody knows, but I think about at least 100 people left the country as far as I know. So not too many. But the question arises that the people are afraid of um, being tried after uh, Lukashenko stripped the, of uh, the military rank. Well, the majority of people who were stripped of the military rank are still in Belarus. They're afraid of getting tried further. I don't think it will be a really good idea for them to remain in Belarus. I mean, those who are stripped of their ranks, I don't think they will get back their ranks. So what do you think, why they are still staying in Belarus? After they lo lost their ranks, what, they, what do they count upon? The people who decided to go abroad are not necessarily those who uh, left the job. The majority of those people are now looking for new jobs, getting re educated. I think about 86 people, or well, the majority of them, are still in Belarus. So there's a big chance that uh, they could be tried. Well, more than half a year passed after they left the military or the service in August. Maybe they should run away and or find a job abroad. They may not have to stand trial. So we shouldn't really you know, prompt them, push them to run away. The question was about the a list and drafting of the list of people who committed crimes while serving in the military and the police. But if it's the junior officers who simply left the service and are not politically active, not commit any such crimes, then uh, that could be a problem. Well, the list is very strange. I don't think it's uh, a list of all those who left the service. I think it was done the following way. Uh, uh, the list of 80 people almost in a random way was made and it was signed. It's a list of people who was, uh, some of them left the service several years ago. I guess there was a limit. I mean, he had the list of uh, the people who left the rank, who were stripped of their military ranks. Thank you very much. 
What other courses do we have? Leonis Karabagate. A question about the professionalism of Siloviki on, on the 9th and 10th of August. Are you sure that that was unprofessional or was it the order they were, they were following? I think we should uh, let everybody ask this question. Let's we'll start with Arseni. That was his thought. I think that without a doubt the order was not formulated this way, meaning that it did not contain any hints at the you know, bloody dispersal. We already had this thing happening in 2010 when the order was to clear the square, but Compare 2010 with 2020, we may say that in 2010, Siloviki acted more professionally. At least there were no dead people, no injuries that uh, were on the border with uh, death. Thus, the sanctions and the pressure they created were not the biggest, mostly symbolic in nature, unlike what we're witnessing now. So I believe, uh, despite that, uh, the work of the propagandists and psychologists during the presidential election campaign, particularly involving the special units, they were not prepared for committing bloody actions, committing crimes against humanity. I think they were given orders in general terms. Let's say on the 9th of August, there was a mistake on the part of the people following the orders. However, the motivation of the Silviki, of the police, could have been, uh, could have undergone transformation. And the new tactic was used. In other words, they may have decided to use chaotic and proportional violence to intimidate people, particularly the protesters. Here I'm, I'm angry with what Lenin said. Thank you, Arseni. I see Igor raising the hands. I disagree here. If uh, we talk about unprofessionals here, we must mention people like Mr. Shaman and the top officials of the military bloc. The overall approach and uh, order to uh, put a blow on the protesters was clear. So the idea was to defeat them all in one move. It started with uh, observers at the police stations who were imprisoned and tortured. Again, there was a general order in, to intimidate people. In terms of tactics, tactics are professional. Actually, the military forces were also very professional in, in the activities and how they surrounded people. Uh, of course, the, the recruits 
the regular recruits were not that professional, unlike a professional in that shape. But there was uh, the general approach was clear. Initially, it was done to intimidate people. It was uh, actually in place for several days. Then the authorities understood that the uh, that the started uh, the informational campaign to mitigate the consequences of this. It was done to somehow keep the face of the police and to uh, show that it was allegedly the mistake of the performer. But it was clearly not. It could have been if one or two people were hit too much, uh, but there was the general order to intimidate people to uh, apply excessive violence. It was uh, professionally coordinated. So the right police and the internal troops were together with the, in this. Compared to 2010, I must say that they were less professional, even though they uh, performed the task they were given. I think unprofessionalism here is in their approach of using violence, unprofessional violence. And the reaction was there and quick. Thank you, Igor. I'm not going to add anything, but for the fact that in 2010, no people died, but there were tens of thousands of people uh, dispersed, but there could have been uh, victims and dead people because the weather conditions and uh, overall the conditions were very much negative. Next question. We don't have too much time remaining. We do have some raised hands. Peter Rutkowski has raised his hand. Right, so Peter, please, the floor is yours. Good evening. As to the statistics of uh, Silvaki, who left the ranks, last autumn, Lichachevsky, representative of the BISO, mentioned the figure of 461 most one official who left the service. What do Alexander and Igor think about this figure? If uh, 461 people left the ranks uh, of the security forces as then, do you think the, the figure is higher now because more time has passed? No, I actually meant the number of people who turned for help. People were afraid of turning for help. While, for example, I uh, took me over a month to decide on uh, whether I want to uh, turn for help or not. Many times I wrote uh, messages and I deleted them. So you mean it's the number of people who turned to help, not the number of people who uh, left the service, right? And uh, you think that the number of people who left the ranks was uh, less than 100? No, I meant the number of them who left the country was less than 100. And how many do you think of them left the service? 
There must be must, many more of those. Thank you very much, Alexander. Sense of context to understand why uh, the Silviki or former Silviki are afraid of turning for help. Why does it happen? Why is it happening? Are they afraid of being persecuted by the state authorities? They're afraid of uh, the messengers being controlled uh, by the state authorities. So uh, when you write the message, you don't know who will read it. Maybe the KGB will. Judging by me and by my example, the single people, um, just very few people turn to help and assistance using this option. The majority did not, because it's very dangerous. Thank you. Indeed, the fear is clear in all this. So, just by your example, it wasn't KGB who read the message. Right. We still have questions in the chat. Thomas Booksbaum. To avoid the revenge or the purge, they could lead to the country having a difficult future. Do you think the, the commission needs to be set up? Special commission needs to be set up just like it was in the other states. I think we've uh, discussed this issue. Do we, do we have anything else in the chat? There's also a question about what uh, Silviki think about being put on sanction list. And what are the prospects of uh, there being criminal cases heard in the universal international jurisdiction courts? How can uh, they affect what is happening in Belarus? Alexander, what do you think? I think that inclusion of Silviki in the session list is actually an effective measure. They really don't want to be there. Before the election, everybody liked to go abroad, holidays, go to Europe, somewhere else, to Egypt or Turkey, and get on the list, being put on the list, is a catastrophe. They will have to stay put to go to Sochi, to Narich, Lake Narich, inside Belarus. That's basically it. And uh, on the point of view, practical side also affects the families, the spouse, the children will now go on holidays without their father and family head. So it would be, it will be uh, big pressure on the man. I know this does affect them. Therefore, they are trying to hide their faces. Just imagine Mr. X is caught red-handed and put on the sanction list. What do you think it will lead to? Do you think they will decide in this case to leave the service for family reasons, for personal reasons, or will lead them to become more radicalized and to revenge on that, revenge this. If you have already been put on the essential list, means you have committed enough crimes to be put on trial. So these people will not repent. 
they will be supported in the regime until the end. Not everyone is supported. It's just, it does affect the people who have not been put on the list yet. For the fear of not getting the list, they will try to behave. What about the universal jurisdiction courts? I think we all know that Lithuania has launched a criminal case with uh, about 20 victims. The same is true about Germany and Czech Republic. Do you think they uh, have a future? I would ask the investigators about this. Are they planning to finish them and when? And what is the prospects? So as I know in Lithuania, they plan to interrogate all the victims that are in Lithuania. That means hundreds of thousands of people. They plan to do the same in Poland. Consequently, we may uh, just imagine how long this investigation will last. Igor, do you have anything to add about the you know, the lists and the universal jurisdiction courts? Yes. Just want to add a few words about the courts. It may be relevant now, but later, I'm particularly against it being at the Hague or similar courts. What we see now is a mistake of the Belarusian people. This is uh, actually, we are to blame for this. And we are to correct it. Thus, it is the Belarusian, Belarusian courts that is to process such cases, whether they will use the constitution, international law for that, is another thing, another question. But first and foremost, the court needs to be local. The same is true about the resolutions. And all. Then this decision needs to be actually spread around because this movement towards authoritarianism is uh, currently witnessed in the United States, in Europe, this authoritarian policies that will soon relate to became dictatorship. Unfortunately, there's no immunity against it. After the Iron Curtain fell, the single ideological line in the West disappeared. And many, some countries, just like Russia, believe that authoritarianism is not bad. It allows uh, to get rid of the migrants and so on. Unfortunately, this is not treatable. Since we created the negative precedent, we need to cure it, we need to punish those responsible and share this experience with other people in the world. Arseny, what do you think? About the socialist and the international court. I think the lists and the courts play more of a symbolic role. They lead to the strengthening of the trend involving sanctioned pressure, which originate in the West. Clearly, the sentences uh, 
passed by the international courts will not be actually recognized in Belarus. But the symbolic side is important. It always allows to draw the attention of the international community to the crisis in Belarus. And I believe that uh, this is a preparatory step to more radical ones, more radical steps, including the creation of a tribunal. If repressions uh, will continue will be become more violent so this is an element of restraint and a warning to the acting authorities about uh, the miscibility of crossing some red lines Thank you, Arseniy. Do no. we have any more raised hands? If not, we'll conclude our discussion. There are several questions. The first one about the emergency state or potential assistance from the Rosgvardia and the attempts, uh, the second question about the attempts to reform the police in Ukraine, the third question about the reform of the military bloc in Belarus. So Svetlana is not here. We should maybe uh, discuss the potential help or assistance from the Russian forces. Let's imagine hypothetically this scenario. If we have mentioned red lines, is there a scenario, a situation when Belarus will introduce martial law, emergency state, and uh, ask for assistance from, from Russia. What needs to happen for this? Or is just a scare goal? It's just a scare imagined by the media. Right. What do you think about this and what needs to happen for that? I think the only scenario when the authorities may announce the military law is the total collapse of the economy that would lead to mass protests around Belarus, but clearly this will be the last decision of the third in power. As of today, the reasons uh, to introduce the military martial law are nowhere to be seen. There's a certain regime de facto regime, could be called half military, half emergency, half uh, military, but legally, I don't think the authorities will do this, because according to this legislation, all the economic losses suffered by the legal authorities and the private persons are later to be compensated by the state. Clearly, the state doesn't have the resources to 
allow themselves to introduce the military commercial law. We even we saw that the lockdown that took place during the COVID-19 pandemic was not particularly deep in Belarus, if any, if at, at all. So it's not on the agenda yet. As to the in terms of the Russian military coming to Belarus, I think it's a more of a psychological scare used by Alexander Lukashenko against protests, against protesters. Obviously, if the scenario takes place, is implemented. The next step will be Alexander Lukashenko losing real authority, real power. He will be replaced by the occupational authorities consists of a military consultant, like uh, basically what we can see now in Nagorno-Karabakh or in Syria. Thank you. Igor? At least in August 2020, it was a scare. But a big question is, uh, who initiated it. Again, I uh, agree that it will mean that Lukashenko will leave, uh, lose authority and power. It's, on, it's only available in case there's a global chaos. Part of the police force uh, switching sides or not following the orders. There are many ways how it will end for Lukashenko. Could lead to the Russian military coming in or some other outcomes. As to the military uh, martial law, again, I don't think it's a viable option. Because de facto, the, all the approaches and the characteristics of the martial law were actually in place, de facto. Basically, they decided to use the approaches of the martial law in a useful time. Let's say it's all done against uh, two. Uh, fight against the mass riots. They uh, call it counter-terrorist operation. Uh, we have a special system of uh, reaction against terrorism. So without the, any legal changes, the jury changes, they decided to use uh, measures they need. Well, basically, it looks great from the outside. I, it means we don't have any emergency situation that we need to notify the UN about and so on. And the foreigners who live in Belarus, it's a big number of problems. We simply uh, adhere to the secret procedure and do all that instead. Does Alexander want to add anything about the Marshall? Alexander is not here anymore. I think we need to conclude our meeting. Very difficult to add anything. I'd like to thank everyone who was with us.